Well, my first thought when I read today's scripture that we're going to be talking about was, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. It's stuff about calmness and power, peace and joy, and connection and hope, and all to the glory of God. So I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing it with you today. Um, just as a little uh, uh, review in Romans 14 that Pastor Jim covered the last couple of weeks, Paul wrote about strong Christians and weak Christians and how we are to respond to each other's differing convictions. Um, you know, the Bible is absolutely black and white about some things. There are some things there's just, it's just, this is, this is what it is. You know, don't worship idols. Don't murder. Don't lie. Honor your father and mother. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And there's a, there's many more, but, but some things the Bible is absolutely black and white about. In these things, in these areas, we are to hold one another accountable. If we see somebody stumbling in those areas, we're supposed to go and, and hold them accountable and hold them up. But in many other areas of life, they are what Paul called disputable matters. These, it is in these matters that we are to be convinced in our own mind. Remember Pastor Jim talked about that. If you believe something about something and you believe it strongly and, and the Holy Spirit has given you that conviction, you are to be convinced in your own mind. So do your convictions prompt you to say no to some things? If they do, then say no. If, if you feel like, mm, I just am not sure about that. I don't think I'm supposed to do that. I'm not supposed to live that way. Don't. Don't do anything you believe to be wrong, even if you see other Christians doing it and it seems to be perfectly okay for them. If you feel like you shouldn't, if you feel like God's prompting you, don't do that. Don't. But neither are we to judge those who may not share our same convictions. When writing about disputable matters, Paul specifically mentioned meat, he specifically mentioned wine, and he specifically mentioned holy days, um, special days. But convictions can be held on just any number of things. We can have convictions about political issues, we can have convictions about um, uh, social and environmental issues. We can have convictions about appropriate entertainment. We can have convictions over under or over. How do you roll? It's over. It's always over. This last week, um, Jim and I and then Beth Graybill were really privileged to go with a group of people from the Caldwell Housing Authority and College of Idaho to go up to Coeur d'Alene and um, spend a few days with St. Vincent de Paul up there and, and checking out and, and just exploring how they help um, impoverished people and homeless people as we look to... Um, hopefully someday have, being able to have a, a day shelter um, in Caldwell. So we got to spend some time in it. While we were up there, I met a young woman who has dedicated her life to working with impoverished people who are living with chronic, chronic mental illness. And it's like, oh my word. She, I just admire her tremendously. She was amazing the way that she uh, was able to just work with these people and love them and help them. She also happened to be very prominently sporting a tattoo that read, fish are friends, not food. <laughs> now that is not necessarily a conviction I share. I loved 
and just just admired her her conviction about working with the the mentally ill, but not that one, not that one. Are R-rated movies taboo? What about violent video games? Should you limit your reading to Christian authors only? For some, the answer might be a resounding yes. What about working or shopping on Sunday? There's a commandment about that, you know. What is your conviction? Maybe your honest, God-honoring convictions lean on the side of freedom. Things, things that might be a problem for somebody else simply are not a problem for you. They do not mess with your faith. They, they, they're okay for you. In that case, wonderful. Very good. Enjoy them to the glory of God. But just as those who have convictions that say no, people whose convictions allow them to say yes, um, just as the people who with convictions that tell them to say no are to judge, people with convictions who, who allow them to say yes are not to flaunt their freedom. Be aware, be careful. <laughs> Don't flaunt your freedom. When your freedom distresses a brother or sister in Christ, and when you know that it is distressing them and you decide to partake anyway, your freedom then has become an idol and is no longer honoring to God. Paul said in Romans 14, 21, and Pastor Jim covered this last week, it is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. This is God's truth. And this is how we are to live. Now on to Romans 15, verse 1. We who are strong, then, ought to bear with the faith uh, to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Paul says, now, we who are strong have an obligation to, and in the NIV it says, bear with the failings of the weak. But a more accurate translation that we find in the New American Standard Bible and the Christian Standard Bible read, bear the weaknesses of those without strength. Do you see the difference there in the translations? There's a huge difference. Your attitude toward me when you're putting up with my weak failings is significantly different than when you are lifting something that I do not have the strength to hold on my own. The first, bear with the failings of the weak. You know, that might come with a sigh and an eye roll. <laughs> but bear with the weaknesses of those without strength. That's full of compassion and care. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Now, again, back in chapter 14, Romans 14 was all about respecting the convictions of, of other Christians, of your brothers and sisters in Christ. But Paul expands that now, not just to brothers and sisters in Christ, but to our neighbor. Each of us should please our neighbors. So, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? When Jesus was asked that question, he answered with the story of the Good Samaritan. And for some of you, you may be very familiar with it. Maybe others are not as familiar. It's found in Luke chapter 10 verses 25 through 37. I encourage you to read it. So again, Luke chapter 10, 
verses 25 through 37. Who is my neighbor? The bottom line, your neighbor is anyone, your neighbor is everyone who is near you, who crosses your path, who you come in contact with on a daily basis. Your neighbor is, of course, the person you live next door to. Your neighbor, your neighbors are your co-workers. They're people maybe that you that you interact with at the grocery store. Your neighbor is anyone and everyone who crosses your path. Paul says, each of us, who's each of us? Does that include everybody? Each of us should please our neighbors for their good. For their good, for their benefit, to build them up. You know, this really is not about you. This really is not about me. This is not about what satisfies you. This is not about what makes you happy. This is not about your freedom to live however you want to live, however uh, you feel like God has allowed you to live. It is all about your neighbor, your brother and sister, the stranger in our midst. That's what this is about. Each of us should please our neighbors for their own good, to build them up. It's for their benefit. And if you're at all like me, you might be thinking, well, that just doesn't sound like very much fun. Because sometimes I want it to be about me. Why does it always have to be about somebody else? Why does it have to be about them? Doesn't sound like much fun, nor is it an easy way to live. It's not easy to live intentionally looking out, how can I please the person in front of me? Most of us tend to lean toward what's good for me. But bearing with the weaknesses of those without strength, Pleasing my neighbor for their good. That takes intent. It takes awareness. It takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of energy. It's hard work. <coughs> so how do we do that successfully? Well, in verse 5, Paul says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus Christ had. Church, this is life-changing. This is life-changing. This is transformation. This is what God does in us to make us more and more like Jesus. Because you know what? God knows us. God knows me. He knows that my inclination is to think about me first. That's kind of my default. It's where I go. He knows that even when our heart's desire is to follow him and to please him first and best, he knows that our struggle is hard. I want to please my neighbor. I want them to be benefited. I want to do good that benefits them. But I have this inclination toward wanting what's good for me, too. And that's what our culture teaches us. You know, the whole self-care. When I was in counseling a year or two ago, my counselor told me, she said, don't call it self-care, call it soul care. Soul care is different than self-care. For me, at least in the way that I think, the way my mind works, self-care is selfish. Soul care 
is connecting with God and letting him be God in me, taking care of me. Anyway, that was just a little sidelight. God knows us. He knows that our inclination is to consider self first. So he, God, who is strong and who is good beyond measure, he encourages us to persevere, to keep on working at it, to keep on trying, to keep on striving. And I don't mean that he's just on the sidelines cheering us on. Come on, Sharon, get in there. Be nice to, you know, Monique today. Be nice to Todd, you know, be nice to your neighbor. That's not what Jesus is doing. The Holy Spirit is with us and is in us. The Holy Spirit of God. And his own strength and his self-giving patience flow in and through and around us and they create in us not only the desire but also the ability to live in peace with each other. In Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, he wrote in Philippians 2, verses, uh, starting with verse 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Sounds like the same message he's saying in Romans, doesn't it? And then he goes on in verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus humbled himself. He gave up his very life out of his love for us. And Jesus is both our example and our motivation. We are to have his same mind. Sorry, there's a fly. When we were up camping, three different times when we were out hiking, I swallowed bugs. And so, pray that I do not swallow the fly. <laughs> okay, sorry, another side light. Jesus humbled himself. He gave up his very life out of his love for us. So, why is it so important to have the same mind as Christ? Why is it so important for us to please others and not just ourselves and not looking out just for our own interests but the interests of others? Why is this important? Why are we look out for one another? Why are we to carry each other's weak bits? Why are we to value others above ourselves? Well, we find that back out in Romans with verse 6. So that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. Don't merely tolerate or put up with each other's peculiar ways. You know? Don't just tolerate one another. That's not, that's not valuing others above yourselves or, or living for someone else's benefit, to benefit them. Tolerating is not doing that. He says, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. This word accept in the Greek means literally take by the hand or 
grant one access to one's heart. So when Paul says accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you, just as Christ willingly gave up his life for us, we are to just as willingly offer our lives to the people around us and accept them with joy and with gladness. In, because of Jesus, you are precious to me. I will treat you that way. Because of Jesus, I am precious to you. And you will treat me that way for my benefit, just as I am treating you that way for your benefit. Does that make sense? It's not easy to do, but we can do it in the power of the Holy Spirit who is in us. We are to do it in order to bring glory to God so that God may be seen and that together we can worship him. Jesus told his followers, he said, people will know that you belong to me by how well they see you love one another. People will know that you belong to me by how well they see you treat each other. You know, what else should we expect as people who follow the one who came not to serve, but to give his life. Mark four or Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man, even Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus did it. Now we are to do it. This idea of people who on the surface are very different than we are, and yet who care deeply and live transparently with one another. This idea is not a new concept that's ushered in by Paul or even by Jesus. It's always been God's plan. We're gonna, we, you might have noticed we skipped over verse four in chapter 15 of Romans. We're gonna go back to that now. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So Paul says everything that was written in the past, what's he talking about? What was written in the past? The law? Scriptures, the Bible, right? The Bible was written. In Paul's time, Scripture was what we know as the Old Testament. It was the law, the prophets, the history, and the writings. And the writings include things like Psalms and Proverbs and stuff. They were recorded to teach us, to encourage us, and to give us hope. They revealed to us the knowledge of who God is and of what he desires. They also revealed to us the, the confident expectation that what he said will come to pass. That's our hope. What God said will come to pass. You know, we are surrounded by people with no hope. I, I just, I see it every day. People are worried. They're worried about war. They're worried about inflation. They're worried about global warming. They're worried about the pandemic that hopefully is kind of over. But they're also worried about the next pandemic to come. <coughs> People are worried about unaffordable housing, about rising food costs, fear about what the future may look like for their children. For their grandchildren. For many, that future looks bleak. And they just don't have a whole lot of 
But Paul declares, we can have hope because God has a plan. And it's not something new that he's just figured out lately. It's the same plan that he has had since before time began. And it will come to pass. And Paul here in Romans 15 says, here, let me show you. Let me show you. You know, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Romans 15, chapter 8, he says, For I tell you that Christ has become the servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. The promises made to the patriarchs are the things that were written in the Old Testament. The promises God gave in the Old Testament. And he says, Christ has become the servant so that these things might be confirmed. All God's promises are settled in Jesus. It is in him that all of God's mercy and all of God's goodness comes together. He is our hope. Yes, sometimes the world looks kind of bleak, but Jesus Christ is our hope. And not just for God's chosen people, the descendants of Abraham, but for all the people of every nation, Jew and Gentile alike, Jesus is the hope for the whole world because God loves the whole world that he sent his son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is our hope and has been before time began. This is God's plan. And now, I like Paul. He loves to quote scripture. Just like me. <laughs> I think he did it first. But Paul now quotes scripture, passage after passage, from God's written promises to prove his point. He quotes from the law, he quotes from the prophets, and he quotes from Psalms. And as we see the scripture up on the screens up here, um, as I read them, there's the passage, you'll see the scripture um, reference from Romans 15, but you'll also see the reference from the scripture that Paul is quoting from, okay? So we'll start with verse 9. And moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. And that's from Psalm 18. And then Paul says, let all the peoples extol him. That's from Psalm 117. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, the one who will arise to rule the nations. Let in him the Gentiles will hope. That's Isaiah 11.10. Who is the root of Jesse? I'll give you a clue. It's Jesus. Jesse was King David's father. And so the root of Jesse, that's, that's looking clear back to King David, the man after God's own heart, and the one that God promised his throne would endure forever. It would endure because of Jesus and through Jesus. Jesus is the, is the fulfillment of that promise. So when Isaiah says the root of Jesse, that's what he's referring back to. He's talking about Jesus. The root of Jesse will spring up. One who arises to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. In him, we have our hope. God's purpose was always to have one people made up of all nations, Jew and Gentile together, following God, praising God, hoping in Jesus. This is what God's promised, and this is what he is doing, and he's doing it now 
Now in our next verse, verse 13, the NIV that I'm reading from leaves the word out, but in this last verse, most of the, the uh, translations in the original language have the word now or therefore, but now. Now, because of all of this, because of everything that we've talked about, because of all of this, because of God's promises, because God is faithful to his word, now, here and now, no more waiting, it's here now, Paul prays, now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a verse we should all memorize. <laughs> we should all memorize. Do you want to overflow with hope? As you live surrounded by people who are hopeless, would you like to overflow with hope? Hope that, that spills out and splashes on everybody around you? Would that make an awesome difference in our families and in our church, in our neighborhoods, in our world? What if each of us lived as if we really believed that God is doing this. What if each of us really believed, lived as if we believed this is true? There is joy. There is peace. There is power. God is doing this. It is happening. And our part is to trust God. Our part is to lean into him, to be fully convinced that he is faithful to his promises. It's easy to say. If it feels too hard for you to, to really be able to trust God, Look around. Look around you right now. You are surrounded by people who are far from perfect, but are committed to hold you up in your weakness. God has given us to each other for our good, for our benefit, and for his glory. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, the bread that represents Jesus' body, which was broken for us, and his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, I'm going to ask that we read Romans 15, 13 together, that we read it as a prayer. And as we read, I want you to remember, you really means y'all, okay? It's, it's plural, it's y'all. So as we read this verse, pray this for yourself and pray this for each other. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.